This afternoon we're covering the what we call the minor prophet Habakkuk. And I've learned a lot from this study more than I was talking to Willie the other day and I've read through the minor prophets but usually I was just reading through them, breezing over them, getting on my way to the New Testament. I'd finally gotten through all the hard parts of the Old Testament. I was ready to be done with the Old Testament. Breeze through them to get to the New Testament, stuff I was more familiar with. But after studying this, I really did learn a lot. Um, I'm going to try not to go off in too many rabbit holes and allow you to do that yourself. There's only three chapters in this book, and sometime during the week, if you have time after the lesson, just go ahead and read through the book. And I kind of had personal applications in my head in three different ways. One was on a national level because we are dealing with, in the book of Habakkuk with how uh, Babylon is going to take over. I tried spelling while I was reading or talking. <laughs> See if that worked out. Uh, we're dealing with how Babylon is going to take over Judah uh, and how God uses world nations for judgment. Uh, so in my head there were some applications to world events, nations around us, and how they interact with one another and how God uses nations, but at the same time doesn't interfere with, self, uh, with free will, which is kind of a difficult concept, but it, it's kind of clarified in the book of Habakkuk. The second way is how we as the church relate to the world. Uh, you know, we live, it seems to be in an increasingly decaying moral decay in the world around us. Uh, and how do we relate to that? How does that affect us? Uh, that's the second way I thought about it. And then the third way was personal. How, uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe that's not it, but you know what I meant. It means personal. I can't talk and write. But I am chewing gum, which is not a good speaking thing to do, but I'm walking in chewing gum. So. <laughs> anyway, so you look at it in a personal light. Um, how do I relate personally to the church around me? Each time we're getting a little bit smaller and honing it in. You've got the national level, the church in the world, and then us on a personal level. How do I relate to the church around me? And uh, do I require judgment to come upon me? Or am I like Habakkuk? Because... Interesting thing about Habakkuk, every other minor prophet, I think every other prophet that we read is bringing a message that's coming directly from God to the people. And Habakkuk is different. Habakkuk has a complaint. He has some complications in his head. He's confused and he has questions for God. And then what we have in the book of Habakkuk is God's response to his questions. And it's pretty interesting. Now where we find Habakkuk is... As we've been going through the Old Testament, we're in the Judah alone period. And we can probably, we've looked at the map long enough. I think we can start filling it in with our heads. You've got the Sea of Galilee up here. There's the River Jordan. You've got the big salt sea down here, remember? Uh, Jerusalem's somewhere around there. Uh, you got Bethel and Shiloh up here. But right here is the dividing line between Judah and Israel. Now at this, at this point, the Syrian army, Assyria, has already come and conquered Israel. This is all part of the Assyrian kingdom already. We're dealing with Judah alone. And Nineveh, way up here, is the, the uh, capital city of Assyria. And way over here, at the time, of course, there's not cell phones, newspapers, there's no internet. Um, so you don't know what's going on in another part of the world unless there's a messenger that happened to come through your town. There's a little city called Babylon right there who's starting to rebel against the Assyrians and eventually take them over. And that's the city that we're going to be dealing with. Uh, but this falls in the time period probably somewhere between 625 B.C. and 605 B.C. There's a 20-year span there where it could be in. 
I think it's probably leaning towards the latter part of that, more maybe around 615 to 610 BC. Um, 625 BC is the last good king in Israel. Remember, the last good king was Josiah. And Josiah made great reforms in the land. Remember, he was the king who, he became king when he was a child. Uh, while he was king, they found the law in the basically abandoned temple, restored the worship. Uh, they had the Passover for the first time in a long time. Uh, and he was the last good king. So during that time, the people returned to God, but it was more so just surface value. Uh, if you remember in Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 10, Remember Jeremiah, and Jeremiah is prophesying during the time of Josiah here. There in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 10, it says, Yet for all of this, yet for all of this, her treacherous sister Judah did not return to me with her whole heart, declares the Lord, but in pretense. So these people in Judah, Josiah turned them back, but it was just in pretense. They were coming. They were uh, performing the sacrifices. They were doing all the things they were supposed to do, but then they were going home, and in their closet or at home, they were still worshiping the Baals and the Ashtaroth and the other gods that they had been serving previously. Uh, and so we kind of take from that, we need to make sure we don't get wrapped up in that. We don't, we're not just getting into uh, the mode of coming to church, partaking of the Lord's Supper, and it just being surface value. Because like Don said, it's not being here on Sunday that saves us. It's Saturday, or, uh, Monday through Saturday as well. Not that it's not required. But, so we just had surface, surface value ser service to God. I was kind of a mouthful. Uh, but then, Josiah dies. An evil king comes back into power, and that wickedness that was just under the surface coming up during the end of Josiah's reign becomes full-blown again. And that's the time period that we see Habakkuk. Habakkuk. Sorry, I looked that up how to pronounce it. It's Habakkuk. I said Habakkuk my whole life. It's Habakkuk. So we find Habakkuk in, probably in Jerusalem, and he's surrounded by evil. He's surrounded by wickedness. Let's go ahead and read the first part. You can turn in your Bibles to Habakkuk. If you get to Zechariah, you went too far, go back just a couple small books. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw, verse 2. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise, so the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. So Habakkuk here... We're, we've got the perspective of what, what I refer to as the remnant. You know, remember those few righteous people that God said He was going to preserve in all of wicked Judah? That's Habakkuk here. And he's feeling pretty lonely. He's righteous and everyone around him is wicked. He's seeing the laws of God be perverted. He's seeing justice is not being carried out the way it should because probably of greed, pride, everything's like that. Just like we see justice sometimes perverted today. It's the same problems then. But everything around him is wickedness. And these are God's people. And it seems like he's, he's cried out for quite some time here because he says, how long shall I cry out for help? And then finally God responds to him. Here in verse 5. 
Look among the nations and see. I'm reading from the English Standard Version if it's a little different. Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if I told you. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. And then he goes on to describe just how fierce they are, how swift their horses are, how they're violent like uh, the evening wolves. And you can read that on your own time. But he says, I'm doing a work that you wouldn't even believe if I told you. The reason that is is because he's not, uh, he's not going to take the, the Medes over here, this nation that's already established and conquered the rest of the world and, and judged Judah. He's not going to bring down, uh, I think it's Lydia up there, already established kingdom. He says he's raising up the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans is where Babylon is. Babylonians and Chaldeans are interchangeable in the Bible. It's the same people. He says, I'm going to raise up the Chaldeans. You kind of have a good, might be kind of like, who? You know, I, now at this point, I think, I think the Chaldeans had already started some of their conquests. So they're, they're probably known about, Habakkuk knows who it is. But never in their greatest imagination did anyone think that Babylon, a little Babylon, could conquer the great Assyrian Empire. But God raised them. He says, I'm doing a work you wouldn't believe if I told you. I'm raising the Chaldeans up. Now something I want to notice here is that the rise of the Chaldeans, this little bitty city of Babylon, to a great world power is due to God. He said there in verse 6, I am raising up the Chaldeans. But, so he's responsible for their rise, but he is not responsible for their character. He describes what kind of people they are. They're a bitter and a hasty nation. They seize dwellings not their own. They're dreaded and they're fearsome. And then all the way down at the bottom of that description of them, at verse 11, it says, Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. That's how quickly they're conquering the land. But he says, They are guilty men whose own might is their God. So, he answers Habakkuk's question. Habakkuk sees all the evil and the wickedness going on in Jerusalem. And he's like, how long is this going to go on? I've been calling out to you for quite some time. And your own people, no one is respecting your law. How long can justice go forth perverted? Why are you indifferent to this? You're supposed to be the holy, just God. How can you be indifferent to all this evil going on amongst your people? And God says, I'm not indifferent. And I'm going to bring down judgment. And it's going to come from the Chaldeans. So Habakkuk, Habakkuk, he kind of responds by saying, okay, well, I'm glad that you're not indifferent to all the evil amongst your people, but you're going to use the Chaldeans to bring judgment down on us? They're even worse than Jerusalem. Um, We'll just go ahead and read, uh, starting with verse 12. Are you not, this is Habakkuk's second complaint. He's confused again. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. And I like that confidence there. He knows if he's righteous, he won't die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment. And you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. Why do you idly look at traitors? And remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he. So he's saying, how can these, you use these people who are even more wicked than Judah, as bad as Judah is, how can you use them to punish us? That just doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem just. It doesn't make sense to Habakkuk. And basically, uh, through the rest of chapter 1 there, he's going on saying, and you know, where is this going to end? If you raise these evil people to a national power, are they just going to go on and keep killing people and taking nations forever? And God says no. So Habakkuk waits 
for the answer from God at the beginning of chapter 2. So most of chapter 1, you see the beginning of Habakkuk's complaint. Then you see the Lord answer him. Uh, and then we get the second question posed in chapter 1. And now in chapter 2, we see the Lord's judgment on the Chaldeans. It says in verse 2 of chapter 2, And the Lord answered me, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. So if, and if, as you continue to read all of chapter 2, he goes through five woes to the Chaldeans. If I have those, I will go over those. Um, but God is saying here, Judah has to be punished. Because of the evil that they've done, the wickedness that they've committed over generations, it's come to the point where it's time for judgment on Judah. And we've seen that from multiple prophets. And he says, I'm going to use the Chaldeans to execute that judgment. Let me back up. Judgment is required, but the tool which I use to execute that judgment is irrelevant. It doesn't matter if I use a big nation or a small nation, a righteous nation or an evil nation. It doesn't matter the fact that judgment is coming down is what matters. Now, one second, let me actually look at my notes for a second. Yes, judgment will indeed come upon this wicked nation. And it might not happen as fast as you think it should, but just wait for it. It's going to come. The promise is certain. It will surely come. In verse 4, he says, The soul that is puffed up cannot live, but the just shall live by his faith. Now this part here is quoted several times in the New Testament. The just shall live by faith. Uh, that's the... the Scripture that Paul quotes to lay his foundational argument, argument against salvation by works in Romans 1.17 and Galatians 3.11. And, and the Hebrew writer, in his day and time, he saw the, the invasion of the Roman Empire coming upon Jerusalem again in his day. And he quotes it in Hebrews 10.37 and 39 as well um, as he sees that coming. And I always kind of misunderstood that phrase, I, I always, I guess I kind of always thought of it as um, the righteous will live their daily lives, lives by faith. But if we look at it here in context in Habakkuk, he's saying that the just will survive by their faith. The just will live by their faith. Babylon, their God, what they have faith in is their strength and their might. And they're conquering all of these uh, kingdoms and building this mighty world power, but they're doing it in an extremely ruthless way. And God is saying, I'm going to use them for judgment, but in the carrying out of that judgment, that I have commissioned to them, if they do it in an evil way, what are they doing? They're sowing evil seeds. They're puffed up and they're proud and they're, they're doing these things out of their own might and their own pride. Eventually, that's going to come back to bite them. And that's on them. And see, that's how free will and God's use of these nations kind of coincide. God will use the nations to His end 
but he doesn't negate their free will. If in carrying out his will, they sow seeds of evil, that evil will come back and destroy them. He goes on with five woes to the Chaldeans. Let's make sure I'm not missing anything here. I'll start with verse 5. Moreover, this translation says, wine is a traitor. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the uh, Masoretic text, it says wealth. Either way, more, moreover, wine is a traitor. An arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. He's describing the Chaldeans. Like death, he has never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects all his own peoples. Shall not all these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles for him and say, and then he goes through these five woes. He's saying all these people that they've conquered in such a ruthless and brutal way, at some point they're going to be fed up with it and they're going to rise up and they're going to rebel against them. The first woe says, woe to him who increases that which is not his. He's saying a nation can overrun the world for a time but then the oppressed people will rise up against it and plunder the plunderer. The second woe, woe to him who gets evil gain for his house. He's saying, woe to the one who makes his own nation rich by coveting and taking the wealth from another, of another nation. The very property taken in such a way will testify against that nation in the day of judgment. The third woe, woe to him who builds a town with blood and a city with iniquity. He makes the point that will a, a people captured in such a brutal and ruthless way and people who are forced to do labor to rebuild that city, are they going to weary themselves defending that city? And remember next, after this nation falls down, the Medo-Persian Empire that was way up here comes and takes over. And, you know, suppose you're in Carchemish up here. The Medo-Persians are coming over. Babylon, all the way down here, has control of your city. They're coming in to take over. Are you going to put up much of a fight if you're from Carchemish and you've been brutally, ruthlessly treated by the Babylonians and here comes the Medo-Persians with King Cyrus saying everybody can worship their own god still. Are you going to put up any kind of fight against him? No. You're going to let him come take the city and just how quickly the Babylonian Empire can crumble. Why? Because... Everybody who was in the Babylonian Empire was taken by force. And they were not treated right. Fourth woe. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor to see his neighbor's shame. He says, now it's your turn. The shame, the reproach, the destruction you have dealt out to others will be returned upon you. And the fifth woe. He says, Woe to the one who builds an idol. We'll read uh, verse, chapter 2, verses 17 through 20. And he's speaking to the Chaldeans or to the Babylonians here. The violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you, as will the destruction of the beasts that terrified them, for the blood of man and the violence to the earth, to cities and to all who dwell in them. What profit is an idol when its maker has shaped it? A metal image, a teacher of lies. For its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, Awake, to a silent stone, Arise, can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. That last verse was a pretty powerful verse to me when I read it. And today we don't, I don't, you know, obviously we don't have a, a problem with idolatry in that sense. But I, I started comparing myself to the Chaldeans, making sure I was on the right side of this story. And as you look at it, look at yourself. Are you in Habakkuk's shoes? Do you feel like you're one of the few righteous among a world of evil? Or are you kind of in the gray area or are you in full-fledged sin like most of Judah was at the time 
our idolatry probably comes more in the form of the Chaldeans where they were worshiping actual wooden images and metal images, but God said that their God was their might, our pride. And that's where it comes in. Really, when it comes down to it, we're worshiping ourselves. If we allow our pride, ego, um, our income, the physical things that we have, if we're putting those above God, what good is it? It's all pretty. It's overlaid with gold and silver, but there's no breath in it at all. God is in his temple. Keep your mouth shut. I missed something I wanted to cover. So from a national perspective, on what we've covered thus far, you know, God's description of the Chaldeans is not flattering. They're an arrogant and greedy, utterly wicked. The Chaldeans were planting the seeds of their own destruction. And that is the way of evil wherever it may be found. Judah had made judgment inevitable. I've covered all of this. Judah had made judgment inevitable by her own sin. I'm not going to rehash that. Babylon, being the nation under consideration here in this book, but the principles that are exp expressed here are universal principles. A nation will stand as long as it upholds decency and justice and its dealings with its citizens but as it becomes more and more oppressive and wicked, it is building more and more towards its own destruction from within, making it susceptible to attacks from within or without. Only in righteousness and justice is their life, whether in an individual or in a nation. And that kind of makes, when we look at this, the, that verse in context that the just shall live by faith, and remember that's the just will survive by their faith. You're going to make it through. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be horrible at times. Basically, in this book, we see that it's bad. Things are bad, and it's going to get worse. But you keep doing what's right, and you're going to make it through. You're going to survive. And then we find in chapter 3, Habakkuk's prayer. It's a prayer for compassion in the midst of of God's judgment. So Habakkuk now knows that Judah is going to be punished for its wickedness. The tool of that punishment is going to be the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans, being as evil as they are, are also eventually going to be punished. Habakkuk sees all this coming and he's terrified, actually. But this last chapter of the book is a powerful poetic description of the power of God who came from Taman, from Mount Paran to meet his people, full of power and brightness. He drove down the nations and scattered the mountains. Jehovah passed the mountains and saw the Lord. Jehovah passed and the mountains saw the Lord and were afraid. And I, I like that part when he's talking about that in his prayer. You know, if you've ever driven out west Maybe even the Smoky Mountains do it for you. They're just so covered in trees you can't really see all the rocks and just how rugged and strong the mountains look because they're covered with beautiful trees. But if you go out west and you see the Rocky Mountains, there's not many trees on them and they're just jagged and they're huge and they're strong and they're fierce and you're just kind of struck with awe being at the base of one. And he says... God passed by these huge, strong, mighty structures and they just trembled. And the Lord marched through the land and threshed the nations. This last chapter, especially towards the end, is about that faith that God talked about. The just shall live by faith. And we see the type of faith that we're supposed to have here in the end of Habakkuk's prayer. But where did he get that faith? 
Think about the structure of his prayer. He goes through the the first, probably the first half, if not two thirds of chapter three, is Habakkuk going back and recounting the things that God has already done, the promises that He's kept. Habakkuk has this faith because God that God is going to keep His promise through all of this calamity because God has always kept His promises. He goes back and looks at the history of His people. Talking about God coming from Taman uh, to Mount Paran. He talks about Him threshing the nations, um, preparing the way for the people to take the land of Canaan. These are things that God has already done. He's looking back and now those facts give Him confidence and faith that God is going to keep His promise. And why did God show up? Why did God come and thresh the nations? In verse 13 it says, You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed one. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. A shameful posture. Every time that God's people wandered, and we've seen this through our study, every time God's people wandered into sin, completely turned their back on God, things got really bad for them. Every time they called out, what happened every single time? It's what Habakkuk records here. God came for their salvation. And because He's come every single time, Habakkuk has a, a faith that is really just astounding. And then at the end of the chapter, we have some verses we're probably more acquainted with because of a song. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruits be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. I forgot to read just before that. Verse 16. I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Habakkuk knows what this conquering is going to be like. He knows it's going to be dreadful. His legs are shaking beneath him. But he's going to quietly wait for it. Not everyone is going to survive. And he's terrified. And then he shows this tremendous faith. Even though the war comes, it destroys my land, it destroys my people, takes them off captive, there's no food, there's no fruit on the vines, there's no herds. No, everything's gone. He's going to live because he has faith. He takes joy in the God of his salvation. God, he has faith that God will save him. And as that translates to us in the New Testament and how we see Paul portray it, is we're not promised, you know, not obviously, not all of the Jews survived that conquest by the Chaldeans. We're not promised that we're going to survive hard times maybe in our nation or through unfortunate events. But we are promised that if we are just and righteous, we will live eternally because of our faith. We will survive forever because we are faithful.
hopefully this study has been at least partly as beneficial to you as it has been for me. And you can ask yourself those questions. You, know, you think about it in a national context and it seems like we're in troubling times from a world perspective, but if you look back through history, it seems like we've always been in troubling times in one way or another. And you can be worried about what's going to happen. But what I've learned from Habakkuk is God's in control. And it may be an evil nation coming to execute whatever plan He has in place. But those people will be punished for their evil deeds. So I try not to worry about it. God's in control all the way around. i got to keep doing what's right and have faith in Him. As it relates to the church and the world around me, like I said before, where, where do you land? You know, sometimes you may feel like, especially younger people, I won't go into that story. <laughs> and run out of time. But sometimes you may feel like Habakkuk. There were times when I was younger where I did feel like Habakkuk. Like, I was a pretty sheltered kid, a pretty good kid. And at times it felt like I was the only one trying to do what's right. And then that has an, a, an effect on you. And then you get to the point where you sometimes you just feel like, I mean, can really anybody make it to heaven? Well, you know, you go to a, a meeting and these are God's people and people are doing all kinds of things that just aren't becoming of a Christian. And that happens at a young age and you start wondering... If these are God's people, the chosen people out of the whole world, I mean, can anyone really be saved? This is the generation that my generation is coming up, and this is what we're built upon. Can anybody really be saved? And it has an effect on you, and you start to doubt, and that can have negative effects on you. Look at Habakkuk. Habakkuk said, it doesn't matter. If all of Judah is worshiping Baals, cheating one another, lying, committing sexual immorality, it doesn't matter. You stay faithful. And you will make it through. And then on a personal level, where do you stand? Do you feel like Habakkuk or as in later years in, in my life, do you find yourself on the other side? Are you the one that has demanded judgment on yourself? If you find yourself there, you're going to pay the consequences of your actions. But God has promised us that if you change and you have faith in Him, you will live. If there's one who needs the prayers of the church, or maybe there's someone who has never obeyed the gospel, never accepted Jesus Christ as your king, ru ruling currently, it's something you should definitely consider. Think about seriously. Seek someone out and have the conversations. If you have had those conversations and you're on the brink, by all means, Come forward at this time while we're standing and we sing. And if anyone is in a position where they feel like they need the prayers of the church, they need the help of their brothers and sisters, or sin in a public manner, you have the opportunity to come while we stand and while we sing. Thanks for watching this video. I know what you're thinking. I don't want to miss another video from this channel. In order to avoid that, click on the red button down there, subscribe, and then click the bell icon. Not only will that alert you each time a new video is uploaded to the channel, it will also help spread the channel to other people's awareness. So, go ahead. Do it. Like right now. Click on it.